Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. A Whitehall knight resigned from an ambassadorship nobody knew he held. And the liberal elite and their media go all Dr. Pavlov. The resignation of the previously unknown British ambassador to the EU, Sir Ivan Rogers, is being spun as a national disaster. Regardless of the fact, whatever your view on Brexit, that he has been a failure. If you're a Remainer, you must accept he failed to persuade the EU of Britain's seriousness in considering leaving and to have pushed for sufficient concessions from Brussels. If you're a Brexiter, you must accept that an ambassador who's gone full Stockholm Syndrome may not be the best man to negotiate withdrawal. Our first guest is today's man of English letters, conservative, principled, a man of rare integrity in today's Fleet Street. He is the journalist, author and broadcaster, Peter Oborn. Peter, in print uh, this week, you launched a ferocious but forensic attack on Jonathan Powell, uh, Mr Blair's man of business, uh, latterly, but for 10 years the king of the Downing Street castle. Uh, on this subject of the resignation of the uh, former, now British ambassador to the EU. Just for the viewers who didn't catch it in print, summarise it if you would. Yes, I, Jonathan Powell, where, within hours of the uh, departure of uh, Sir Ivan Rogers, came out and made a series of public statements, including one on the Today programme to the British nation, saying that this was a collapse, an attack on civil service integrity and decency. Here was a principled public servant who was been undermined and destroyed by a uh, by a uh, a government determined to politicise uh, the national interest. Uh, and the point with that, which I came, we, I listened to this uh, live, and I couldn't believe it. Jonathan Powell, as you will remember, as I know, and I've recorded. Um, was the person who corrupted the Downing Street machine, along with Alistair Campbell. They, they went in there, they, they, they waged a sort of war on principled public servants. They only imposed a, a collection of Blairite sycophants. Um, they, they broke down the barriers between party and state. And to hear Jonathan Powell uh, go all moral on us, when this is a man who did so much damage, to deep and lasting damage to the British... Uh, constitution. Uh, it was too much for me, I'm afraid. It was, uh, he was the king uh, or the czar of uh, a nomenclatura mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, which served uh, Blairism and, and war. And as oh, indeed, you... I pointed out, of course, that he has interfered in the notorious dossier mm -hmm. uh, in wep on, the, on these weapons of mass yeah. destruction, that he was a courtier to Bush and to Blair. Yeah, a million people lie dead uh, as a result of this cabal. Least, yeah. uh, so it's not a small matter. And he's the last man who should have been out defending the sanctity of, uh, of an impartial civil service. I'll, I'll grant you that. But let's look at the issues beneath. Uh, this ambassador, I confess I had never heard of him before, uh, his way going, uh, we are told, is, uh, is a disaster for uh, Britain and that it's been caused by muddled thinking at cabinet level, prime ministerial level, about Brexit. Now, this has some traction because there is still a lack of clarity as to whether we're really leaving, the terms on which we're leaving, uh, what the uh, outcome might be, do you recognise at least that, I speak as a Brexiter myself, that it's not at all clear when we're going to leave and on what basis we're going to leave? That's absolutely true. I mean, there's all kinds of ways in which we might uh, go, and let's, both of us would agree we want to go cheerfully and in good, good spirits and, and in good relationship with our, our former European partners. But it, it's... it's, uh, it's I don't think we have any sense at all what Mrs May has in mind. Is she serious at all? Because obviously she's not, she wasn't a pro-Brexiter and she seems neither, one way or the other. No, I agree. I mean, there are a number of, you're very wise there, there's a number of paradoxes embedded 
in Mrs May when it comes to the European Union. She was in favour of it, uh, she wanted to remain, and now she's trying to lead us out. Um, and there's a lot of pressures on her. Um, is, uh, my own view is we should just leave, actually. I mm. think it's the... Just send a memo. Yes. We're leaving. Uh, do it. We, yeah. we won't put any tariffs <laughs> or uh, yeah. barriers on you uh, unless and until you put them on us. We're not sending you any more money. Henceforth, we will decide who comes into our yeah. country and who yeah. must leave it. Yeah. Uh, but we give you the assurance that we have no intention of deporting any of the EU citizens who are currently living here. What you do with our citizens living in your country is, of course, a matter for you. That's really the end of it, isn't it? You don't really need to get... It's not rocket science, this. Yes, I, I so agree with you, and I think this is becoming apparent. Now, if you look at the inwardness, what's actually going on with the departure of this um, uh, ambassador, who, as you noted, nobody knew who his existence before day before yesterday, the, there is a battle. There's a, there is a very fierce rearguard action going on, uh, in all, which involves the city of London, the big investment banks, the civil service, the, the, the rump of Blairites, uh, George Osborne, Nick Clegg. They're all at it. And, and they want us to leave and to stay at the same time, which means that we continue to abide by the rules of the European yeah. Union. Uh, 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 and they, they, it is, they, they try and maintain that that's a, a good thing. Now, the, why, that, that is why you need negotiation, because it, that involves, involves in the Sir Humpty Dumpties of this world, the, the, the individual who's just gone. And uh, he's then, he negotiates this, that and the other, all these. And you, you get involved in some incredibly complicated bureaucratic morass, which goes on for years and nothing ever happens. Now... Actually, yes, you put it very well, George. You could just leave. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. No, uh, but as always with Mr Blair, there's a third way. Uh, Osborne wants us to stay and leave at the same time. That's mm. true and a good, very good way of putting it. But Blair doesn't want us to leave at all. And he's now back on the field mm. with £10 million in his war chest. He has this week announced... Uh, he's setting up not a think tank, but basically a fighting organization with 10 million of his money, he says, and the ability presumably to bring in more money. He intends to stop Brexit. And the way, presumably, that they intend to do that is to push for a second referendum, which they would hope uh, might uh, reverse the, uh, the uh, decision of the first. Your friend and mine, Tony Blair, just when you thought it was safe to get back in the water, he's back. How do you react to that? I think if Mr Blair um, wants to come back into British uh, public life, he, he really does need to engage with uh, the Iraq, his history, uh, and he needs to acknowledge that that Iraq war was a terrible thing, a ghastly mistake, most terrible mistake. Uh, I, I think that it, and he seems unable to do anything of the sort. He hasn't properly apologised for it yet, even. S so I, I, I don't think that Mr Blair is wise to want to return to British public life or right to do so. What would be the impact of yeah. his 10 million, though? Mm -hmm. 10 million buys a lot, uh, and his cause has the backing of much of the Mandarinate mm -hmm. in Whitehall, many of the members of parliament on, in all parties, most of the press, mm -hmm. all of the BBC, uh, the City of London, uh, the biggest of big business, they all want to scupper the Brexit result. Mm. That's a formidable potential coalition. Uh, we were discussing earlier today Really, the, the new dividing line in politics is not the old left-right, whether X percent of the economy should be in public ownership and, <laughs> or, or, or X minus, uh, not whether the rate of tax should be 30 or 40 percent. And These are old politics, really. The, the new dividing line is between... Uh, those who support remaining in the EU and its globalisation and neoliberal economic uh, uh, platform, who want to go to war with Russia and fight Assad in Syria and move NATO 
further and further onto the lawn uh, of the Russians and so on. These are new dividing lines, aren't they? And Trump and Farage and me and you find ourselves on the same side. I think one of the other ones, and I'm speaking as a conservative, and you are, I know, a very honorably Labour, is community versus individual. Yes. Mm, yes. And I think the last 10, 20 years, the victory of neoliberalism has been about individuals. Yes. Uh, and as a conservative, I say this as confidently as you would. The enormous disparity of wealth, for instance, the destruction of very long standing consumer. For you, as for me, as a conservative, as for a principled Labour person, the destruction of ancient communities and the ties that bind people. That's a very big theme, I think. Marx wrote in 1848 that all that was sacred would be profaned, mm. all that was solid would melt into air. Mm. You know, 150, 170 years later, that's actually happening, that mm. under the neoliberal globalization, nothing that's sacred is sacred anymore, mm. and nothing that tied people. Their, their project is the atomization of societies and even of countries, don't you think? Well, atomization very much of countries. The European Union has been a project for the destruction of countries, of industries, of jobs, of values. Mm. Uh, and we've seen, we're living through this in the most profound and terrifying way at the moment. Try going to southern Italy, try going to Greece, try going to southern mm. Spain. You're seeing the absolute inhu inhumanity of it is unbelievable. The, the wiping out of the hopes of entire generations of young men and women. That's what you're seeing. The, the bankruptcy of countries. Uh, these are very dark times. Mm. Now, what we'll, are the be, we'll be, we've no time, oh. unfortunately. We'll be calling each other comrade soon. <laughs> Peter Auburn, a man of English letters and a wise one too. Coming up, it's the former mayor of London and veteran Labour leader Ken Livingston. Don't miss it. Welcome back to Sputnik. New Year's Day wasn't over when it became clear that for the Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn, 2017 wasn't going to be much different to the year just passed. The field of conflict has shifted from Parliament to the trade unions as the Blairites seek to knock away Corbyn's support mechanism there, and to the Fabians. Lenin said that George Bernard Shaw was a good man fallen among Fabians. Today's Fabians seem committed to the fall of another good man, Jeremy Corbyn, with their carefully timed and some say rather self-serving prediction that Labour may be headed for a 1935-sized rump of just 150 MPs. Who better to review the year ahead for Labour and our mutual friend Jeremy Corbyn than the man who was twice Mayor of London, a former Labour MP and leading member of the party's NEC, until, like me, being kicked out of Labour. It's Ken Livingston. Ken, Good thanks time. for joining us on the Sputnik. Let's start with the Fabians, a mild-mannered mm. group of people normally, but their mm. New Year present for <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn was far from mild-mannered. What did you think of it? Well, I, I'd hope that after Jeremy's decisive re-election, all this backstabbing, most Labour MPs have stopped doing it because they know Jeremy's going to lead us into the next general election. Their seats are at risk if we don't unite. And these poor poll ratings, they are bad, but who's surprised? We've had a year of internal conflict in the Labour Party. Put that behind us, let's focus on the economy because nothing good is going to happen in the next few years in Britain. I may, at the very best, will limp along her government with low economic growth. At the worst, we go back into recession. So it's a potential disaster. And as long as Labour focuses on the economy, Jeremy can win. I mean, people will be so sick and tired of all they've had under Cameron and now they're going to have under May a savage attack on our services. I mean, my local council in Brent, about half its income from the government has been stopped. I mean, libraries are closed. I mean, teachers... I mean, in London, we've got a huge um, problem now because I mean, a teacher is paid £25,000 a year. Uh, if they've got to rent a room, 
I mean, that's going to be half their, their money will be gone in that. I mean, we're in a disaster and nothing about May's government is going to lift us out. I mean, she often says some quite, you know, encouraging things about looking after the, the poor and those struggling hard, but they've done damn all about it. And she served in Cameron's government where they just made life worse for ordinary people. And Jeremy well, focuses are, on the economy. Yeah, well, these are all the reasons why the Blairite uh, forces in Parliament should desist but evidently they are not. They've just shifted their mm. emphasis. The Fabian mm. uh, candy floss, for mm. that's what the research was, mm. I mean, it was based on opinion polls dating back mm. to the challenge uh, to Corbyn. In the last of those opinion polls, Labour was 31, the Tories were mm. 38. Not bad at all going into mm. the kind of but period. Look, when you and I came into politics, I mean, people just stayed with one political party all their life. If they were unhappy, they might abstain, but they wouldn't switch to another party. Yeah. Now people change their mind on the way to the polling station. Yeah. I mean, so that's why polls at the moment aren't terribly impressive. They've had a pretty dreadful yeah, record. Well, yeah. and, Deservedly you know, bad press. I mean, if in exactly the same way that Donald Trump in America tapped into the anger of ordinary people who've seen the good jobs go, their life getting worse, that's exactly what we've got to tap into in the Labour Party. I mean. In the last general election, I was in marginal Tory seats all over the place. The number of people who stopped me and said, what did the last Labour government do for me? And that's why the Blairites are so bitter. They know, actually, they had 13 years in power. They could have changed this country. They could have made it better for ordinary people. They carried on sucking up to the bankers, you know, doing whatever they wanted. The wealth went to the top 1%. Ordinary people didn't get their share. Well, uh, let's talk about him, because he's not history, he's back. This very <laughs> week, he's announced a £10 million war chest of his own money, he says, mm. uh, and presumably able to attract much more, mm. uh, to essentially re-enter the political mm. sphere. Uh, he says he doesn't want mm. to be Prime Minister again, <laughs> says he thinks that that's impossible. Mm. Uh, we'll see if he maintains that for long, but he is back and he's going to be uh, in conflict with other political forces. Now, here's a paradox. The Blairites were the most pro-EU people mm. imaginable, mm. yet those same Blairites are now attacking Corbyn for failing to opt for an end to free movement of Labour. Mm. This is going to mix up a lot of politics, no? Well, we if Blair comes in and starts attacking Jeremy Corbyn, Corbyn's poll ratings will go up. I mean, I think Tony Blair is the only former Prime Minister in my lifetime who can't walk down the street without armed protection. Mm -hmm. He is the most loathed political figure. Paid by the taxpayers. I mean, no, <laughs> yeah, paid by us, yeah. I mean, no, I mean, I think it isn't just the war in Iraq, it's the way he's made his money mm -hmm. ever since mm -hmm. that he stopped being Prime Minister. Being attacked by, by Tony Blair, I mean, Tony Blair should just go off, lie in the sun on some exotic beach and slowly uh, fade away. He's not going to have an impact on our politics. It's, it will just cause more disruption, more, de I mean, d taking the focus away from focusing on the economy, which is the absolutely crucial thing. You actually look at Jeremy's programme for a massive public sector investment to modernise our economy, cracking down on Google and Starbucks and all these tax dodgers. I mean, the vast majority of Labour members actually agree with that, as does the public. Well, Jeremy was Bernie Sanders before yeah. Bernie Sanders. Uh, and we hear talk mm. of a kind of relaunch mm. of Jeremy mm. as Britain's uh, Bernie mm. Sanders. That requires him to be out in the country, don't you think? Mm. He's spending too much time, and the air is very stale mm. uh, in the House of Commons. He'd be better, mm. and he'd meet better people mm. uh, on the streets and roads of Britain's mm. towns and cities. Well, I think that's what's coming, because you know, he's been tied up with all this internal fighting and all of that. As I said, I think the vast majority of Labour MPs know there's no point carrying on with that. And I think it's going to be a much more open camp. I mean, Jeremy's basic style, all my lifetime, I've known him, that he's always been out there campaigning on issues with groups and so on. I mean, he's been an MP, but most of what he's achieved has been working in those various right. camps campaigns outside. And I think focusing on that, it might be that we don't have an election until 2020, but increasingly I'm thinking if 
it looks like we will have a Brexit because the EU isn't going to allow us to stop the migration of peoples. And so we might leave in you know, April the 1st, 19, uh, 2019. That'll be devastating for our economy. We won't have negotiated any trade deals or anything like that. So I'm beginning to worry that you know, Theresa May might decide to have an election before the Brexit so that you know, she can escape uh, the pain of that. So we might get an election even this year. Mm, and that's what, I mean, Jeremy, I mean, he, 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 it's Simon Flesh, who used to be my chief of staff, initially was um, Jeremy's, but he's been put in charge of preparing for the election. So I think they're, they're gearing up for that. If we have an election in 2017, the Labour candidates are going to be today's Labour MPs. What good could come of that? Well, I'm in, I mean, I was always in favour of automatic reselection, that, you know, every run-up to... I mean, in America, everybody standing for Congress, they're subject to a... I mean, however many decades they've been in Congress, they can still be challenged exactly. for the nomination of their party. Exactly. Over here, it's more... Yeah, I mean, just... We did used to have it. I mean, back in the early 80s, we brought that in. And I think that makes MPs much more responsive to their local party members. So I'm hoping that a lot of these people who've been stabbing Jeremy in the back will be challenged by the new members that have come in and say, well, we don't want you as our MP anymore. What about the trade unions? Uh, Len McCluskey mm. has been a pillar of support for progressive uh, policies mm. long before mm. Jeremy Corbyn. Mm. It's entirely wrong to caricature him as mm. uh, Jeremy Corbyn's uh, puppet. Mm. He, he stood for them yeah. just as long as Corbyn has. Mm. Uh, but he's now under challenge mm. from a man who seems to be uh, playing to the uh, Parliamentary Labour mm. Party playbook. Uh, what do you think of the chances of success for the Blairites there? I don't think they've got any, any hope whatsoever. People really like Len McCluskey. He's a decent guy. He, he didn't become a trade union leader, I mean, multi-millionaire or something like that. He fights for workers' rights. And it, it does look pretty obvious. I wouldn't be at all surprised to find that the same people who are funding the campaigns against Jeremy will be funding this campaign um, to try and get rid of Len McCluskey. But they will fail in that. I mean... McCluskey's a national figure. Hmm. Lastly, uh, the, I want to talk to you about the media. Uh, when you were the leader of the GLC, hmm. Greater London hmm. Council for younger hmm. uh, viewers, uh, your life was made a misery hmm. by uh, a rapacious press. Hmm. But that was before the 24-7 media hmm. era was before social media, mm. before Facebook, Twitter, all of that. You are masterful mm. at handling that. I used to uh, gaze in wonder at how you managed to turn their attacks mm. into increased support for, mm. for yourself. You were great at handling uh, media mm. attacks. He's our friend, I don't like to say it. Mm. Jeremy's not quite so good. What could he do to well. improve his public relations persona. Well, I mean, we know that the bulk of the press are not going to fairly report what Jeremy's doing. And, I mean, the, the Labour Party team around Jeremy are focusing much now on the internet and the social media, bypassing the journalists. But, I mean, I think you've got too fond a memory of my time there. After I'd been leader of the GLC for six months, my poll rating was down to 18%, which is, I mean, even worse than Jeremy's <laughs> got now. I, but... I'm like Jeremy. I didn't change my policies because of all the lies in the media, and Jeremy ain't going to do that. And I think people see, here's someone who's got the integrity to actually not give in I mean, to the Murdochs and all the others and the, the Lord Rothermere's and so on. And I, mean, I, I don't have the slightest doubt that his poll ratings will go up like mine did. It takes a year or two to get that across there. Ken Livingston, thanks for joining Thank us you. on the Sputnik. <laughs> And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? First off, Britain, Brexit, and uh, there's the resigning EU ambassador. Um, which, who knew we had one? <laughs> Phil said, resigning civil servants overstep the mark. Ministers decide, or in this case, the British people. An ambassador is someone sent to lie abroad for his country. <laughs> uh, he's not there to uh, make his own lies. He's not there to paddle his own canoe. Mm. Uh, his only purpose is to convey and work for the line of the government whose ambassador he is. 
And clearly, this man uh, was not doing so. No. Neither before the referendum nor after it. Now, on uh, the Parliamentary Labour Party uh, and their relation towards Jeremy Corbyn, Becky says, how many working class vegans can he actually connect with? Well, it is a good point that um, Jeremy does look and, and appear and sometimes act a little too vegan. All respect to vegans, and, w and we need their votes. <laughs> but you need to reach out wider than that. Outside of Islington. <laughs> well, that's all the tweets that we have time for. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. Uh, but you can stay in touch with us on social media, RT underscore Sputnik on Twitter or Facebook. Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.